Good afternoon and welcome to the 11th WAP seminar of the year. WAP equips leaders and change makers with rigorous evidence-based strategies to advance women and gender equity. Uh, the spotlight focus of the gender and public policy seminar for this spring has been gender and politics and we have had an incredible slate of 12 speakers in the series who have been joining us virtually from all over the world. Um, today, I'm super excited to welcome Professor Kelly Dittmar presenting her research on defining progress, gender and intersectional dynamics in the 2020 election. So to give you a bit of background on Professor Dittmar, she is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Rutgers University Camden and Director of Research and Scholar at the Center for American Women and Politics at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. She was also the project director of Gender Watch 2018, a project of CAWP and the Barbara Lee Family Foundation. Uh, Professor Dittmar's research focuses on gender and American political institutions. And at CAWP, she manages national research projects, helps to develop and implement CAWP's research agenda and contributes to reports, publications, and analyses. Um, she has written a lot on these topics. So she is the co-author of A Seat at the Table, Congresswomen's Perspectives on Why Their Representation Matters, and the author of Navigating Gender Terrain, Stereotypes and Strategy in Political Campaigns. If you don't follow her on Twitter, you absolutely should. She is an expert source for all things gender and politics. She has been on numerous media outlets and talked a lot to um, various newspapers such as MSNBC, NPR, PBS, The New York Times, The Washington Post. She is all over the press. Um, and so we're very excited to have her. Um, I should say we welcome WAP's podcast community, which has downloaded the seminars over 59,000 times. Um, and so we're so pleased to have a lasting and broad reaching impact beyond those who are able to be with us today. Um, so here's how things are going to work today. So Professor Dittmar will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we will have 15 minutes for questions from the virtual audience. We ask that you hold your questions till the end of the talk, unless Professor Dittmar invites otherwise. Um, those who have a question will have the opportunity to be unmuted to ask your question out loud. We do ask that any questions be brief on topic and posed in the form of a question, please, and also related to the topic of today's seminar. Um, our colleague Katie Omberg will be managing the Q&A portion of the seminar. So with that said, I will turn, turn it over to Professor Kelly Detmar for her presentation. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Maya, and thank you all for having me. Um, you know, it's been a while of talking about the 2020, 20, the 2020 election, and so I appreciate those who are willing to still indulge in this topic and look more specifically at sort of gender and some intersectional dynamics in the election. Um, I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of background um, on what I'm going to be presenting from. Um, so today I'm going to talk about findings from a report I've written for the Center for American Women in Politics. And from now on, I'll call it COP because that's the easiest way uh, to, to keep referencing our center. Um, the goal of the report and much of the real-time election analysis that preceded it is to provide a fairly comprehensive and research-based, but also timely and accessible to broad audiences, um, accounting of how gender and the intersections of gender um, and race particularly shaped 2020 legislative elections. And so we're looking at congressional and state legislative elections primarily. This is work that COP has been committed to for nearly 50 years, translating research for public audiences and also using scholarly research to inform applied work. That's really baked into our mission. And so with this in mind, uh, we released the report as a microsite, um, complete with interactive data visualizations. There's an entire data visualization bank, if that's the uh, thing that excites you. We have links to original research sources. Again, the idea is to lift up the research that the great research that's already being done here. Um, so there's a complete bibliography and then illustrations in the form of videos, campaign ads, um, social media, uh, web clips, et cetera, that help, especially uh, for those of you who might teach or be sharing this with folks who might not be in academic spaces, to really illustrate some of these concepts that we try to pull out and I try to pull out the themes um, throughout the report. Um, if you're interested, there's also, if you go to this address, which is womenrun.records.edu, we also have a 2018 report where we did a lot of the same uh, work, um, and it has a bit more of an extensive scholarly review as well of sort of baseline research looking at the barriers and opportunities for women in electoral politics. Um, so as you can see here, the name of the report um, is Measuring Success, 
uh, women in 2020 legislative elections. So very similar and overlapping with this idea of how do we define progress and how do we measure success? And those are the questions that I wanna grapple with a little bit in my presentation today and really start with this broad question of, again, how do we measure success for women in electoral politics? Uh, of course, at first glance, this seems like a simple answer. The more women who win elections, the more successful they are in politics. Um, but I want to push us all to consider, of course, different and various um, measures of electoral success, not only for women, but also thinking about this in terms of gender and intersectional progress. I also want to challenge conclusions that assume success for some women means success or equal success for all women. Um, so before I elaborate on those different measures of success, and I'll kind of focus on three throughout, uh, or three sort of themes, um, I do want to lay out the nuance I believe is necessary in even embarking on this type of analysis. So this is sort of the ground, the ground rules and assumptions that I'm working from. First, um, looking at the success of women in isolation from men too easily ignores the persistent and continued dominance, or I like to say overrepresentation of men in electoral politics and all this whole thing. So this is your very basic, like, remember the denominator, right? So, you know, when people celebrate 100 women in Congress, you say, yeah, but there's 535. Um, and sometimes we forget the denominator. So um, making sure that we are paying attention to that. Second, an emphasis on women instead of gender often misses out on key ways in which gender norms and dynamics uh, shape and are shaped by both men and women uh, candidates. And, and then of course, office holders, voters as well. Um, so this means looking at men and women, masculinity and femininity in our institutions, but also pushing beyond those binaries. And finally, if we're gonna focus on women, we have to do so in ways that don't lump all women together to fit a singular narrative of success. Um, so it's key to interrogate the intersections of gender with other identities that are key to candidate motivation, experience, and behavior. Uh, of course, in this report, we, we spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time looking specifically at race and ethnicity, as well as ideology, um, in realizing how gender plays out differently for candidates um, who are differently located at these various intersections. So the easiest and sort of the most straightforward way, or at least it appears to be straightforward way to measure gender parity in politics is by numbers alone. So we have an entire section in the report, you know, just called by the numbers, which you can dig into all sorts of ways in which we can look at uh, success. And you, one of the basic claims here, of course, would be that if women are just over 50% of the population, then they should hold 50% of posts across levels of government. And so I probably don't need to share with you all, but scholars like Jane Mansbridge, Suzanne Dovey, many others would argue um, that this upholds the basic standards of fairness and legitimacy in a re representative democracy, that political leadership is demographically representative of the population it serves. Um, of course, um, by this measure, the United States fails um, and falls short of gender parity at all levels of government. And this is after the 2020 election. Um, a record number of women serve in Congress and state legislatures today, but while women are over 50% of the population, they are less than a third of elected officials at and above the state legislative level. And even in our big city mayors, uh, we have as of today, 32 mayors in the top 100 largest cities. So again, still falling short of that one third measure. Um, and this just gives you, these charts just give you a sense of that progress over time. Um, as well as what you're seeing on the right is what changed due to the 2020 election in terms of the level of women's representation. And I should obviously note that some of these numbers have actually changed since then. Uh, we've had some variants in Congress that we can talk about. Um, but this gives you a sense of like, as a result of the election, what happened. Um, in 2020, a record number of women filed to run for the US Senate overall and from both parties. A record number of women filed to run for the US House overall and among Republicans, uh, Democrats actually matched the record high number of candidates for the House that they had hit in 2018. And for those of you who were paying attention and those who could not avoid paying attention, 
you'll remember that there was all the attention to the pink wave and the surge and all of that. Well, that was because the numbers of Democratic women candidates increased so significantly over the course between 2016 and 2018. So Democratic women matched that level in 2020, but they didn't continue to see a rise in the number of candidacies. Part of that has to do with incumbency. They were winners. Um, but um, it did change the partisan dynamic, which I'll talk about a little bit more. If we look at uh, nominations, those who got through their primaries, a record number of women were also nominees for the US House across and within parties. Um, and then if we look more specifically as well at women of color and break this down again to look specifically at the trajectories for different groups of women, um, there were also a record number of Black, Latina, Asian or Pacific Islander and Native American women running for Congress overall and for the US House and a record number of Black, Latina, and Native American women nominees for the US House. Uh, record numbers do not denote parity. So again, if we're looking at measures, one way to measure success is we hit a new record, um, but that record doesn't equal par gender parity. Women, for example, in 2020, uh, the 2020 elections were 29.1% of all House candidates who filed uh, to run, and they were about 35.6% of nominees. I do want to point out here, if you look on the right-hand chart, which is the women as a percentage of nominees for the House, um, you look at that middle sort of blue bar, and you see that women were about 47.9% of Democratic nominees for the House. That's getting quite close to parity. Um, obviously very different than Republican women who are at 22.9%, even though this was a good year for Republican women. Um, the other question here gets to another measure of representativeness. If there are more women in the Democratic Party uh, than men, perhaps 50% isn't the measure of total representativeness. So we can continue to sort of question and play around with what the measures would be um, that would make us sort of happy with the representativeness in both the candidate pool as well as among elected office holders. And then just to give you a sense of what was happening at the state level, again, we had a record number of women state legislative Led of state legislative nominees, um, but not for Democrats. And so again, you can see that this is a, a different party story than what we saw in 2018. Um, in, in some parts, almost a complete reversal, although the variance um, is different for each level of office. So of course, this partisan difference is a really important point about being clear about which women are finding electoral success in which environments, at which levels, and in which election years. Um, the gains for women in election 2018 were concentrated solely among Democratic women at every level of office. The number of Republican women declined in the U.S. House, among governors, statewide elected executive officials, and in state legislatures between 2018 and 2019. It was probably most notable in the US House, and you probably heard about it most there, that the number of Republican women dropped from just 23, which is already a small number, um, to 13, again, out of 435. The story was very different in 2020. Um, in 2020, Republican women were responsible for all of the increase in women's house candidacies, as I mentioned before, and they accounted for most of the gains in the number of women house nominees. They were also the majority of non-incumbent women winners, right? New women, freshman women into the house. Um, and so this gives you a sense, and we have a more detailed layout of this on our website about you know, what happened as a result of the election. You can see there's 28 new non-incumbent women that won. And then if you look at the party break, 19 of them are Republicans, nine are Democrats. Um, so that's about 68% of the new women are Republicans. And of course, we had a newly elected Republican woman swear in just last week um, that was elected after um, the election. The freshman class of women in the House of Representatives coming out of the 2018 election is a very different story, right? So that year we had the largest ever uh, number of non-incumbent women winners, 36, and of them, one was a Republican. Um, so that party break, party difference, again, significantly different between these years. Republican women uh, were also responsible for flipping 
11 House seats from Democrat to Republican. And that included four seats that they flipped from Democratic incumbent freshman women who won for the first time in 2018. Um, and so what we're seeing is women in 2018 and in 2020 were running and winning in the most competitive seats, the seats that are flipping parties, which is double-edged. On the one hand, it shows how competitive women are and it challenges these electability myths that somehow women can't win in these competitive areas. In fact, they're winning more in those areas. On the, on the same uh, note, however, they're also most vulnerable when we get to the next election, right? Because these are seats that are likely going to switch. So, you know, if you talk to any honest Republican practitioners, we they know that these women who won this cycle often are in some of the most tough races coming into the next election. So holding those seats will be important for continuing the progress for Republican women. Um, as a result of all of this, Republican women not only made up for the seats that they lost in 2018, but of course now they hold a record number of House seats at 31. Um, that again tells you though that they are still just over 7% of all House members. Um, and more specifically, and despite their gains in 2020, Republican women um, continue to be a minority of women candidates, a minority of women nominees, and they remain a minority of women office holders. So they're about, they're just over 25% of the women who serve in the U.S. House. Republican women are also a smaller proportion, uh, were a smaller proportion of candidates and uh, nominees, um, and are a smaller proportion of office holders within their party than our Democratic women. So as of today, uh, women are about 40% of Democrats in the House and 14.6% of Republicans in the House. Um, both parties saw a somewhat of a gain. Republican women saw an, a sig more significant gain in terms of their representation in their caucus as a result of the 2020 election. And I should just note here that the story, both in 2018 and 2020, has been different for women in the US Senate. Um, while the first woman was elected uh, to the Senate from Wyoming, that was really one of the most notable um, gains for women in the Senate, or the only gain for women in the Senate last year, Cynthia Lummis, um, the losses of Martha McSally in Arizona, Kelly Loeffler in Georgia, and of course the ascendance of Kamala Harris to the vice presidency meant that women's representation actually declined um, in the U.S. Senate from 2020 to 2021 and is of course then short of record levels. And lastly, and I promise I will move beyond the numbers, um, while women of color today serve in record numbers, again, in Congress, statewide elected executives, state legislatures, success for women of many racial and ethnic groups in both 2018 and 2020 has been of a different kind of that um, for what, than for white women. Again, in 2020, many women of color were celebrating electoral firsts, which should remind us that the success for women of color in American politics is occurring within a system that has been especially marginalizing to them until much more recently than for white women. Um, and just to give a sense from this cycle, you know, this included first for the first three Korean American women elected to Congress, the first woman of color ever elected to Congress from Missouri. And those are just a couple of examples at the congressional level. Um, two data points help to point this, put all of this, though, into perspective. As of today, 25 states have never sent a woman of color to Congress, including 46 states that have never sent a woman of color to the U.S. Senate, 26 states that have never sent a woman of color to the U.S. House. And of course, only five women of color have ever served in the U.S. Senate. Um, and you're looking at close to 70 white men who serve um, in, in the US Senate today. Um, so you can look at that as, again, a recent history and a continued gap of representation. And of course, the ascendance, again, of Kamala Harris to the vice presidency marked both a first and a loss. At the same time that she became the first woman and the first Black and South Asian person to become vice president, signaling, obviously, a, a hugely significant point of progress in American politics, the Senate returned to being one of the most powerful political institutions in the United States with no black women in it. 
Um, and of course, only four women of color at all serve among its hundred members. And so while we're celebrating, we're always continuing to look at these measures of success and progress in context of also these areas of under continued and persistent underrepresentation. Um, this means that any conclusions that our work is done and the work for women's political equality are obviously premature. Um, and we particularly have work to do in distinct um, targeted work to do across party, racial and ethnic and geographic lines. One last thing I wanted to point to in terms of state legislatures is um, we have a record number of women in state legislatures today at about 30.9%. This was an increase um, from 2020, um, but as you can see on this chart, not a huge increase, right? Um, so we've seen a pretty flat line in the increase in women's representation at the state legislative level. We see this jump as a result of the 2018 election. Um, and then uh, the, the gains this year are important, but don't say to us that we're on this upward trajectory um, that's going to get us to parity incredibly quickly. And you can see here, this just gives you a sense of specifically what was happening as a result of each election. So if you look at the gray bars, you can see that partisan story is distinct. We saw almost a net gain of about 300 Democratic women legislators in 2018 or as a result of 2018, while we saw a drop in Republican women. The 2020 election saw small gains for both Democrats and Republican women at the state legislative level, even with Republican women gaining slightly more uh, seats. So again, it just mirrors that, that trend we see in the House. Um, in 2021, women represent 50% or more of state legislators in just one state in the country. So we've only reached parity in one state legislature, and that's Nevada. And then we've done so in three state senates and four state houses. Um, so again, progress, right? Um, we, we went from having zero chambers that have 50%. Um, but this is obviously the minority of our state legislative bodies that have um, gender parity in their representation. Um, so I want to move to sort of beyond these numbers, and this is another way of measuring success to finding progress. Um, especially when we take into consideration the historical and, and intersectional differences that will give us sort of different an answers about how far we've come. Um, so there are real limitations in a purely qualitative, or quantitative, excuse me, take. So first, women's electoral success may come in different ways, um, especially among women and as well as in ways distinct from men, um, and despite hurdles on the path to success. So this is to say that these end result numbers, whether it be candidacy numbers or how many women serve in office, can mask some of the gender challenges, hurdles, et cetera, that, are, that precede that point and precede that numeric outcome. So that's why in the report, I explore the path to office for women legislative candidates. And here I'm looking particularly at House candidates. And I find a few signs of progress, uh, gender progress, as well as some of those persistent hurdles. And I'm just going to touch briefly on a few of these points. Um, one is women nominees for and winners of US House seats in election 2020 were more likely than those who were unsuccessful candidates to have held previous elective office. So this is often a question about what qualifications do women need to be successful? Um, and great work from my colleague Sarah Fulton and others have shown that qualifications matter more for women in their success. Um, and it's because voters are more skeptical about women's qualifications. And so she finds that if you look at women in the house, they are just overall more qualified than their male counterparts. These findings sort of show that that seems to continue to be true in this election cycle, um, particularly um, that they are coming from established sort of what are more normal paths to office. That was not true in 2018, I should say, but in, in 2020, that was more of the story. Um, also, we saw a number of rebound candidates, um, women candidates. These are women who lost um, and uh, decided to run again. Uh, so we had 87 non-incumbent women who lost congressional or statewide races in 2018, ran again this year, many of them who won. And I think in doing so demonstrated that the path to electoral success for women and men, um, but in this case, we're looking specifically at women, is sometimes paved with loss. 
but that women are running again. Um, and again, other research from Danielle Thompson shows this, that there's not a, pro a gendered issue with candidate reemergence that has been sort of out there that like women are less likely to run again. It's not being proven, at least in the, the House congressional research. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, and in contrast to also previous findings in political science literature, uh, women didn't have more primary opponents than men overall in the 2020 House elections. Again, a good sign. Um, however, there was a distinct difference for Democratic women of color House candidates who were facing more primary opponents on average than white women. And we don't have a good explanation. So this is something where we would say there should be more research. You know, we should be looking into what's going on at that primary stage in terms of attracting primary opponents. And again, how does that in inform outcomes? Does that make it harder to win, more expensive, all of that? And while there were a record number of all women general election US House contests in 2020, something that was certainly anecdotally cited a lot um, because folks wanted to know were Republican uh, party leaders or recruiters targeting Democratic women who won in the last cycle with other women. This was a sort of theory out there. Um, I can't prove that that was not the case, but certainly we looked at the comparison and we found that Democratic women incumbents were no more likely than Democratic men to face or to lose to Republican women challengers. So that gives us a little bit of insight into that question. And lastly, I spend a lot of time in the report, there's a whole section on what happened with Republicans. Um, you know, what made this year um, a better year for candidate emergence among Republican women as well as success. And I will just say one sort of overview here and happy to talk more in questions. The rebound of Republican women in 2020, I would suggest relies on an established, albeit small, support infrastructure. And that's largely outside of the party combined with enhanced attention to the crisis of Republican women's underrepresentation by candidates and some party leaders, mostly Republican women. Um, but Republican party leaders and organizations still resisted the type of direct intervention, specifically the targeting and the support of women candidates primary, uh, prior to primary elections that would be needed to see those numbers increase in a much more significant way and in a sustained way over election cycles. So talked about the path. Now I wanna talk about a sort of final measure of gender progress or success. And here I'm arguing that numeric success can occur without shifting the gendered ground upon which campaigns are waged. And this really gets back to um, my first book was, which was on navigating gendered terrain in, in campaigns. Um, and I, in that book, I describe campaigns as gendered institutions, you know, they are shaped by gendered norms and stereotypes that guide both candidate behavior and voters evaluations and expectations of candidates. Those stereotypes create different rules and requirements for women and men who confront these different realities when they're running for office. And so I probably don't need to again belabor it with this audience in particular, but it's the idea that we hold expectations um, of what it means to be a man or a woman, our gender stereotypes, we hold expectations of what it means to be a candidate or a political leader, those are our stereotypes of candidacy and office holding. And if you look at the research, the political psychology research, like work from Alice Eagley and others, you see that there is role congruity for men, right, a congruence between what we expect of men and what we expect of leaders, and that incongruity for women. Um, that is changing in some ways. And I would argue that part of that is due to the work of candidates and campaign practitioners. In other words, they play a role in either reinforcing the system and reinforcing those uh, perceptions with voters uh, or challenging them. And so to me, that's part of how we measure success. If you want these institutions to be disruptive of that congruity, that gender congruity, that masculine equals leadership, then those who are running campaigns and waging campaigns have to be a part of pushing voters to think differently about what candidacy looks like um, and the things that we value in our candidates and elected leaders. In some of the interviews I did for that project, um, I, I talked to uh, Mary Hughes, prominent political consultant, who told me, you know, gender really ceases to be a factor if you do your job well, right, as a candidate, uh, excuse me, as a practitioner. A consultant. 
And so candidates and their teams have long found ways to address voter expectations so that the perceived disconnects or violations of gender norms are not disqualifying for voters. But again, that has often meant that they've reinforced this idea that, you know, look, women can be just as good as men. They can be just as manly. They can be just as strong and tough. They can have the same expertise. Instead of saying there might be something distinct and valuable, and we might broaden our horizons about what we um, expect, again, and value in, a, in terms of fitness for political office. So um, what if women and men altered instead of adapted to the credentials for candidate success. And so I want to look at some examples in 2020 and just point to some ways in which I think we saw some of that disruption and some other ways in which we see some either adaptation or I would say sort of um, reinforcing of the, the gendered uh, norms and, and racial norms as well, racialized norms about what we expect in political leadership by the women themselves. So here I'm looking again, primarily at women running for the house, giving examples from those races. So in 2020, some women candidates campaign strategies, again, similar to 2018, we saw some of this progress, uh, certainly a lot of this progress then, demonstrated um, and contributed to this shifting gender dynamics and gender terrain in American politics. Women running in 2020 embraced their gender and intersectional identities as electoral assets um, instead of hurdles to overcome in route to election day, emphasizing the importance of diverse representation. And so you have a couple examples that I'll just uh, point to. So this is Representative Marilyn Strickland from Washington. In her first ad, she reminds voters that she would be the first Black person ever elected to Congress from Washington, that she would be one of the first Korean American women to serve in Congress. And of course, she achieved these milestones. She is now in Congress. But her point in the ad, and that of many of the women who did talk about being first or breaking barriers, went deeper than marking a historical moment, right? So it, was, it wasn't just about being the first. In the same ad, Strickland describes the discrimination that her immigrant parents faced in seeking housing in 1960s Virginia. And she vows to make this experience, the experience of her parents, quote, ancient history in America. So she's tying it to public policy, right? And together, Strickland's pitch to voters goes, again, beyond the simple plea of making history, but instead connects identities to lived experiences and perspectives that are going to benefit congressional policymaking. Um, before her, and even more overtly, probably many of you are familiar with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's uh, opening sort of ad that went viral in 2018, where the first line was, women who look like me are not supposed to run for office. What was unique and important about that ad is she was directly confronting perceptions of what was normal in congressional elections, you know, saying to voters, I know you don't normally see people like me, but you should and here's why. Um, in 2020, multiple women, um, especially women of color, if you look at the, the ads, um, followed her lead. And so there's an ad um, in New York, again, from Jackie Gordon in her first campaign video. It begins with her noting, quote, there are people in Washington who think being different is a threat that don't want to see women who look like me challenging the old boys club. She added, um, but I've got news for them. We're tired of being ignored. My name is Jackie Gordon and I'm a bit different. So really embracing that identity instead of saying like, look, I can, I can meet these same standards that the white guys who have held this office for so long um, uh, have, have conformed to or would conform to. Um, this was not, uh, this happened across party lines but was more common among democratic women. And we can talk about why in terms of identity politics. Um, and perceptions of identity politics. But Nancy Mace, who's now in Congress, in her ad, this is her first ad as well, she says, for years I've beaten the expectations set by others. You can't do this, you can't do that. You know what I say, to hell with that. She has these images of these men in front of the Capitol. So she, she too is saying, look, I'm bringing something different and new and I've proven I can be successful. And so instead of simply trying to meet the often higher standards they face on their paths to electoral success, I think these women congressional candidates 
question the very standards by which we select our political leaders and suggest some alternative values that voters might consider before they cast their ballots. I think that's a good thing. Um, Women candidates also leveraged their identities more specifically um, as mothers. This was very common in 2018, certainly was common, you know, was evident before then, but I think what you're seeing is more diverse ways in which they are talking about motherhood and leveraging motherhood than they have in the past. Um, and specifically to do so in ways to communicate distinct policy perspectives, priorities, and a sort of passion on certain issues. Um, and so <clears throat> you're going to be familiar probably with the 2018 examples, some of the most, you know, cited were women who were breastfeeding in their ads, but of course, Kelda Royce, who breastfed in her ad, was talking about BPA and bottles, right? Like, so it wasn't just, I'm proving my credential as a mom. Um, it is that that gave me insights to make good public policy for infants. Um, Zephyr Teachout actually got an ultrasound in her ad in 2018. So again, the opposite of shying away from, you know, showing that you're going to be a young parent, um, which is something that women had often been told to do in the past. Um, in 2020, a couple of examples, Becky Grossman running in Massachusetts um, pointed out to voters that there were just 25 moms of young kids in Congress. And so you see this in, in the quote from her ad with her son. Um, I remember Jack's first day of kindergarten, we talked about what to do if he saw a scary man with a gun. Until we elect more moms who've had this talk, nothing is gonna change in Congress, right? So it's not just, I'm a good mom, it's I'm a mom who understands the issue of gun violence in this intimate way, and that's why I'm gonna work on it when, we're in, when I'm in Congress. Um, Cori Bush talked about um, a different talk that she as a black mom had to have with her sons. And so in her first ad, she says, as a black mom, I'm sick of having to say to her sons, just make it home safely. And so again, in these cases, women are using motherhood as a credential for empathy and understanding, as well as a driver of policy priorities and outcomes. I do wanna note here that partisan differences are evident and probably in ways you would expect. Um, if you look at the gender role um, beliefs and expectations among the Republican electorate and the Democratic electorate, which do vary, um, with Republican voters being more likely to hold traditional views about gender roles, Republican women were more likely than Democratic women candidates um, to leverage motherhood, not only in a policy way, they did that too, um, but they also did it as an affirmation of that adherence to gender roles. In other words, I'm a good mom, I'm a proud mom, I really value that role. Um, and so just an example of that, Ashley Hinson, who's now in Congress, one of her major sort of themes was, I am a proud mom, proven leader, proud mom. You saw that throughout a lot of her messaging. Um, this example from Renee Swan, I think is probably the most overt when it comes to the more traditional uh, uh, characterizations of motherhood, where if you look sort of down in her list of bio, it says one of her you know, proudest accomplishments is raising four men to be great husbands, uh, fathers, and servants of their communities. Right, so that's a different way of talking about motherhood. It's not hugely divergent from democratic women, but you can understand where they're coming from in ways that that might be less disruptive of the norms we've been talking about. Um, another thing is that certainly when we think about disruptive or adaptation, women candidates in 2020 met masculine expectations of candidacy and office holding in both stereotypically masculine ways. I'll give you a few examples and via strategies that you could argue more, were more disruptive of established uh, gender power dynamics. So I'll go through these quickly. I wanna be thoughtful of time. Um, some women candidates continue to adopt or co-op stereotypically masculine imagery and rhetoric to prove these masculine credentials. So this ad from Kat Kamek in Florida um, uses both masculine language and imagery. Um, specifically, she says, I'm done with the Washington wimps that won't support President Trump, right? Use emasculation as a strategy, right? Um, uh, we need fighters with grit. Um, she ends the ad. She shoots a gun in the ad. She ends the ad with a gun. Um, the symbolism of guns is across all of the ads from Republicans, but including Republican women. Um, that's obviously ideological, and it's an affirmation of, you know, Second Amendment rights. 
um, but it's also gendered, often used to convey conservative bona fides as well as toughness um, via a tool, i.e. a gun, of brute force. Uh, so I don't think we can completely separate those things. Um, women candidates, though, also found ways to communicate toughness, I would argue, again, in less stereotypically masculine ways, including stories of um, overcoming personal adversity. So Linda Lake, a pollster, often talks about this as like slaying a dragon, right? So you can be tough in ways that don't have to mean punching somebody, you know, shoot, shooting a gun, um, playing sports, those sorts of things, um, physical strength. And so a lot of that adversity that's pointed to in, a, in many of the women's ads, things like gender and racial discrimination that they faced as a sign of strength and resilience. Um, this is an example from Kansas where Michelle De La Isla said, I understand what it means to fight with grit. Again, using that same language of grit, but then she flips it to say, my grit is coming from living in poverty. I was homeless. I survived domestic violence and I beat cancer while struggling to pay the bills. I never gave up. Um, and so there's a different way to, to communicate that. On the Republican side, Lisa Scheller, who ran in Pennsylvania, talked about fighting her own addiction, again, as a sign of uh, resilience. Um, the last thing I just wanna point to, as, to open and then open to questions, um, is to say that Republican women specifically in 2020 presented themselves in many ways in direct contrast with and opposition to Democratic women, especially the progressive women who won in 2018. And this gets at some of the uh, uh, re-entrenchment of some of these particularly gendered and racial tropes. So yes, on the one hand, there was a point of progress here because they were saying, look, women are not monolithic. We are not the same as the women who ran last time. That's positive. Um, and so you saw them do that in overt ways, like we're gonna be the conservative squad. We want results, not resistance, right? Pointing to the theme of resistance in, in the 2018 election. This woman, Anna Paulina Luna, called herself the anti-AOC. Um, but beyond highlighting these substantive policy contrasts, the targeting of freshmen women of color, particularly Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib, and the squad more generally, um, both capitalized on and reinforced, again, some of these gendered and racialized tropes, particularly targeting these women as Republicans did across the board, not just women, uh, but targeting them as extreme or threats is a tactic not only effective due to ideological positions. As women representing communities, whether racial and ethnic, um, religious or generational, that have been marginalized from power and characterized as least, uh, at the least unfit and at the worst dangerous, they were really used as symbols of a direct challenge to the white status quo. And this proved to be a successful strategy, but I also think it's one that is dangerous in reinforcing uh, these tropes and also challenging. They don't represent progress, in my opinion, right? For challenging these institutions and progressing these institutions that would make them more welcome uh, to women and women of diverse backgrounds going forward. So I'm gonna stop there um, and just say that you know, these points obviously focus a lot on women and what women did in the election. And we also uh, certainly have to look at the ways in which male candidates, strategists, et cetera, are also either reinforcing or disrupting some of the gendered and racialized norms of campaigns. And so happy to talk more about that or anything else folks are interested in in Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much for those remarks. If uh, anyone has a question for our speaker, I encourage you to go down to the participants tab and hit the blue raise hand icon. It's in the lower left corner. And would, uh, we would love to unmute you and have you in conversation with our speaker. And if for any reason uh, being unmuted doesn't work for you, feel free to pop it in the chat and I can ask it out loud. Maybe, maybe I can ask the first one. Um, I, I'm not sure you know the answer to this, but I'm just curious to, to see if there's any research on it or how we should think about it. You said at the outset that a good benchmark for representation would be about half. And a lot of your 
plots kind of show that. And I'm wondering if there's any studies or analyses that look at how people evaluate institutions that get close to half or even institutions that exceed half. I know that we're not, we're not there yet. So I guess the question is like, from the public's perspective, what are they looking for? Are they really looking for 50%? Um, do you know any work on this or what do you think about this? Yeah, there's been a couple of surveys that have included some variants of that question. Um, and I think most recently, actually, my colleague Kirsa Mamatsu did some of this work. Um, she was looking at uh, perceptions of descriptive representation. Both do people get it accurate, right? Are they accurate in, in, in perceiving the current underrepresentation of women? And I should say, um, in work previous to hers and others usually find that people don't have it right. In other words, they don't know and they typically are gonna assume that there are more. That may change in this environment, right? Where we, where we were actually talking sort of actively about women's underrepresentation across institutions. So I think there's a bit more realism um, in women's representation that way. But then when it comes to the ideal, the questions are often, um, instead of giving a specific number of perceptions, like should there be more, right? Is it important for institutions to have gender parity? Um, and the problem with those questions, obviously, are social desirability bias. You know, people are like, yeah, it's important. But there's also huge um, partisan variance that I'm not sure is fair to Republicans, because when you see these questions, what happens is Republicans are much less likely to say that it's important. Um, or that they want more, it's usually the question, do you think there needs to be more women in office? Um, and I would suggest that that's a little bit biased because they assume uh, that more women means more Democrats because that has been how it's been. I mean, it shows that that's a partisan problem. Um, it shouldn't be that assumption, but it certainly is. Um, so instead, what you see is not a huge gender gap in that response, but you see that Democrats overall think there should be more women in office see that as a value um, and therefore, um, and, and democratic women are often more likely to sort of assess, uh, be better, better assess the current represent, under representation of women. Um, but I think your specific question about, is a sort of additional question, which is then do they see the institutions, how do they evaluate that in terms of its, if the institutions work better or worse? I think there have been a couple of survey questions about that, but not a sort of nice large, you know, large scale study that would dig in a little bit more on those perceptions. Thanks so much, Maya. If anyone else has a question for our speaker, I'd love you to go down and click that blue raise hand icon so that we can call on you. Or else I'll just keep talking. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> like, wait, there's more examples. Yeah, is there anything you didn't get to share that you're like, oh man, I really wish I'd gotten to this to share with the group? I mean, I think there's the one other thing that I, I didn't point to, I sort of um, glossed over is um, we still see, you've heard a lot right on the double binds of, of women in politics, um, as well as in other fields, right? Are women trying to prove that they're both, you know, meeting the masculine expectations of political leadership, as well as these sort of more feminized, feminine expectations of being a woman. Um, and there's a, a great example, again, from 2020, where there was a candidate in um, Texas who basically said, you know, I, again, I can sort of do both. So Genevieve Collins um, did this ad and she said, I'm a Texas woman. And that means, quote, you have to be able to shoot clean and eat your kill one day and then throw on your dress and work a board during the next. Um, and so there was like all of this, you know, engaging of, don't worry, you know, I'm a woman, I'm a Texas woman, and this is, I adhere to those expectations, but also I'm really tough and strong, right? I shoot and kill. Um, and so we still see that, um, but I do think we've seen some variance um, and again, some progress in that women aren't sort of forced into that formulaic thing of trying to be everything to everybody, be the Sarah Palin, you know, hockey. Mm sort of mom, you know, pit bull and lipstick model. 
Yes, totally. Thanks for that. And I see Naomi has raised her hand for a question. Naomi, I'm gonna unmute you now. Thank you. Um, I was curious, did you notice any trends in terms of sort of what types of jobs or employment the um, women that have been getting involved more in politics lately have had? You know, I think of, you know, we never would have thought of, you know, a bartender, you know, right. running for Congress a few years ago. And I was just curious if you've seen any trends um, about that. Yeah, so we did. And, and we lay out some of the counts of, you know, like what percentage and what were the most common occupations, particularly for women. And again, in the House, it was easier for us to do um, that versus all of the state legislative candidates. But um, we did. The interesting thing was that 2018 is really the outlier. And one of the questions was, would that continue into 2020? And I think we have a sort of mixed story. So 2018, as you're noting, sort of AOC and, and others, there were just more women coming from really sort of diverse backgrounds, non-traditional, if you will, though I think even that we have to be careful with calling sort of traditional path to office, but certainly what we've seen in the past, you know, lawyers, business, et cetera, um, that we had more women coming from professional backgrounds, um, and community backgrounds that were just different. Um, and that that was a positive sign that we were expanding the candidate pool. Um, and of course, if we wanna get women to be a larger proportion of the pool, we need to do that. Um, we need to be looking at and thinking about all different backgrounds that will lead women to public service in this format in, in elected office. Um, so 2018, we saw greater diversity. I would say included in that, were women who were active in their communities, um, but didn't see elected office as the place to get things done. And this gets to what we often talk about as women are do-it-yourselfers, like they've been excluded from these and marginalized from these institutions for so long, particularly um, Latina women, Black women, you know, her saying like, I don't need to be a part of this institution in order to make a difference for my community. In 2018, we saw more of those women say, okay, I need a seat at this table. So I'm gonna translate that activism and advocacy into candidacy and some were successful. Cori Bush in 2020 is an example of like, wasn't successful in that frame in 2018, but ran again and was successful in 2020. Because Republican women were the larger proportion of newcomers um, to Congress in 2020, we saw a sort of return to, they came from more traditional backgrounds elected office, and then business being the most common. So business owners, business leaders, um, whatever that sort of entailed, you know, that larger umbrella of having that background, which isn't, um, which is not abnormal for elected officials and certainly um, consistent with Republican elected officials being more likely to come from that business background uh, than our Democrats. And so, um, so we don't see a consistent trend is the point. And we see a partisan difference. Um, and I think going into the next cycle, as we look to if these trends continue, that's one of the things to, to keep an eye on and to see if those women who were saying, okay, maybe elected office is the place I can get things done, if that continues to be the case, or there's a return to sort of cynicism and saying like, nah, this place not worth it. And I think January 6th and all of that it could have those effects, right? So we have to think about and watch for how that affects candidate emergence. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, great, and I see Charlotte has her hand raised. Charlotte, I'll unmute you now. Thank you so much. I, um, I was really interested in the part of your talk where you're questioning the assumption that any increase in women's representation is good for dismantling power dynamics. Yeah. And you mentioned toward the end, for example, that women who are women candidates who are denigrating women of color was a bad sign. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you make that judgment call about whether certain increases in women's representation is a good thing for gender and racial equity. Yeah, and I think I don't have the answer. In fact, I don't think there is a a singular answer here. One of the, the challenges we often have, so, so I work at a center that promotes women's political empowerment, right? And we're nonpartisan. 
And we always, you know, have people say to us, well, you're just telling us to vote for women because they're women. It's like, nope, that's never been the, the case. If I am talking about progress and equity for women in politics, I'm saying women should have a, a playing field that's equal, right? Like it should be just as, they should be just as able to be successful. They should be held to the same standards as men. Um, and those things don't have to be partisan. And it's not a judgment call. I'm not telling you which women you should elect or vote for, but it is about that we should try to remove the hurdles to any women who are trying to get into those office. The secondary question then is like, what is good for women depends on how you measure that. So if I'm measuring it as, well, what is good is to have an open system of competition. Um, but if you measure it by policy outcomes, then your version of which women you know, are best for progress for women is certainly going to be different. Um, and often, you know, feminists will say, well, Republican women in particular, you know, Republican women are voting against their interests or they are anti-women. And I think we have to be really careful about that because they have interests that are gendered but they are just not the same as yours, right? And so all of the great work done after the 2016 election about white women voters, in particular white women voters who voted for Donald Trump, demonstrate that there are gendered and racialized intersectional interests that would make them think that that is in their best interest, right? To support this candidate or support these policies. Um, and so, I think when it comes to thinking about policy outcomes and progress, um, that that is much more dependent on the voter, right? And your perceptions of what um, is good, what is progress for women. And then lastly, on the sort of institutional aspect, which I think is the middle of that, which is yes, we need to remove barriers, but we also need to not reinforce stereotypes that are damaging to women across the board. And that's where I was trying to get at, yeah, with this point about, I don't think it is good that Marjorie Taylor Greene is putting out, you know, a literal sort of hit on uh, AOC and Rashida Tlaib and really using these tropes about dangerous women of color um, as a way for her to be successful. That does feel quite, you know, openly um, regressive when it comes to the progress that women could make. And, it, and my point there would be Marjorie Taylor Greene can be successful not doing that, right? In ways, and even if I had, you know, no agreement with her policy positions. Um, so I think we have to interrogate sort of different axes of what we even mean by progress, gender progress, gender equity, and look at what, how different groups of women might define that. And then also what you, obviously believe in value for yourself and the women that you'll support. That is a very long way to say that certainly electing to your, you know, what you said at the start, you know, electing any woman is not the goal, um, but making sure that the, the playing field allows for the election of a diversity of women is also important. Great. So um, Professor Dittmar, we're actually running out of time. So I really want to take a moment to thank you for coming and to thank all of you for attending. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And um, again, I really encourage you to, to follow Professor Dittmar on Twitter and follow what she's up to in terms of her um, public speaking and engagement with the media.